In the second part uh, of the lecture, uh, we will talk more about Central Asia. Uh, we will talk, uh, apply more concretely uh, those, let's say, more general uh, issues, more general uh, facts and things uh, which were presented in the first part. So uh, what's the historical geopolitics of Central Asia itself? Uh, of course, I should start from the definition, what is Central Asia? But actually, this part uh, will be explained uh, in the other lecture. Um, this first part uh, of the handbook deals with this in more details. But uh, right now, I have to tell just one thing. Always starting uh, the classes, the fir very first class, of uh, Central Asian politics or courses on Central Asia, I'm asking the students, how do you imagine, what do you include into Central Asia, and how do you imagine this region? And uh, almost 90% of students, at least those who uh, came to my classes, think about Central Asia in its contemporary borders. Saying, okay, yeah, basically these are these five former Soviet Union states. Maybe uh, we can add some more, but uh, to make the story short, we have to think always that uh, borders of Central Asia, this is nothing like, nothing very uh, clear. Again, coming back to, uh, to Central Europe, history uh, or the, the geography and borders of Czech lands, for example, they are quite clearly visible, even from satellite. There are border mountains. But as we saw in a previous part, borders of Central Asia are not clearly marked by uh, some real clear mountain chain. And even they can cross the mountain chain. This mountain cluster might uh, be also included, and uh, we can cross these mountains uh, to some way or another. So uh, in this sense, Central Asian borders, in a, in a course of history, are uh, very volatile. And it means, consequently, that the geopolitics of uh, Central Asia should be volatile as well. And again, coming back to the question uh, we talked about uh, in, the first, uh, in the very beginning of the lecture. So uh, Central Asia is very often considered as kind of subject. Yes, these are the states where some other powers has its own influence, its own interest. Very often, Central Asia is considered as kind of uh, subject, or as I said, victim of geopolitics. But in the past, we have to see, uh, we have to bear in mind that uh, Central Asia not only was not the subject of uh, of geopolitics. It was the object, and even at some, uh, some certain periods, uh, it was very living uh, transit area, hub for trade and uh, um, transport from one part of the Eurasian continent to another. Or even uh, Central Asia was what we might call, uh, with a very uh, high language, as some kind of cradle of cultures of civilizations. So, uh, and of course, this issue, these two issues, are uh, very often pointed out by local uh, elites in Central Asia. Okay, uh, well, uh, speaking about this outside influence, uh, what we should bear in mind, what are the tools to perform the control over the region? Of course, one of the first things you might uh, can be, uh, come to your uh, come to your mind are well what we might we see today military political control uh, some military campaigns which uh, conquer conquered uh, some regions starting from uh, even coming of uh, Iranian tribes uh, on the territory uh, going through uh, Persian empires several Persian empires having uh, their own interest and geopolitical interest in Central Asia. Uh, talking about Arab Caliphate coming to the, uh, coming to the region, bringing uh, the new religion, and also uh, include 
uh, Central Asia as a part of this vast uh, Muslim geopolitical empire. And of course, uh, we can speak about Russian slash Soviet empire, which came to uh, conquer Central Asia in 19th century and kept uh, this region under its control, uh, at least up to 1991, and to some extent uh, tried to maintain in the region uh, even today, forming one of the very important uh, outside power uh, having interest in the region. And of course, economy. Yes, definitely. Today, when I, uh, see, uh, speaking about geopolitics of Central Asia, there are again quite numerous of articles, books, uh, chapters on China and its economic influence in Central Asia, because this is something which is the most visible uh, issue. But Central Asia, it again, I repeat, this is not just a uh, subject of geopolitics. Central Asia played during the, the peak of Silk Road, played a very substantial role in a global, global trade, and not, not just as, a, let's say, some kind of transit area uh, through which uh, the loads and the goods quickly or as fast as possible uh, move from one part of a continent uh, to another one, as we can see it very often right now. Or uh, move away uh, some natural resources from Central Asia through some transport artilleries uh, away from the region. At that time, in the Middle Ages, uh, Central Asia, uh, Central Asia played quite an important role in, uh, in this, let's say, global uh, trade route. Of course, migration. In the last, uh, uh, in the course of history, there are numerous of migrant uh, wave of migrants. You have some of them: Huns, Turkic tribes, Arabs, Mongol, uh, Mongol expansions. And of course, as a, as a last uh, point, uh, this Russian uh, migration to Central Asia, uh, bringing uh, this kind of factor into, uh, uh, into uh, the region, which is today very much cultural, uh, which has a very great cultural impact. And those uh, of you who are uh, especially from Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, or from Tashkent, uh, or to some extent even from uh, Dushanbe or Ashkabat or some other uh, places, uh, this Russian impact is still highly, highly visible through uh, the language, through pop song uh, which spread all around the Central Asia uh, through uh, Russian films uh, being trans uh, translated in, uh, in uh, TVs and so on. And uh, coming, uh, this is some kind of uh, going from migration to another point, cultural, uh, cultural diversity and cultural uh, geopolitical impact. Well, uh, you might see, at least from this very short uh, list, how many uh, cultures, how many uh, cultural impacts several Central Asia, uh, Southern Asian uh, region went through. And this is not, of course, uh, this is not the ultimate list. I might add uh, a lot of uh, others. So uh, this culture geopolitics, I talk uh, right now about Russian uh, cultural uh, impact, but uh, in the past, you might see quite a different culture uh, layers uh, being in Central Asia. Uh, with the culture, we might also think uh, we might also spe speak about religion, and I will also uh, make uh, provide you with one map uh, which shows this issue. Well, uh, speaking about the volatility of Central Asia, well, you can see here. Well, uh, there is a quite fair question. Well, I just picked up uh, one historical period uh, in the uh, mid 9th century. Well, can you tell me basically where is Central Asia here? Yeah? We can see, yes, uh, we can see Caspian Sea, so we might frame uh, this former Soviet republics as this kind of this uh, region, probably. But uh, we have total different and volatile borders of this, and uh, even in some periods, this uh, region simply doesn't exist. Okay, uh, 
Now let's talk about a few and selected cases of uh, Central Asian geopolitical regions, geopolitical concepts, uh, and geopolitical, uh, let's say, factors, which influenced. First of all, uh, one of the most one of the most famous one, uh, the most uh, famous, let's say, geopolitical. Uh, geopolitical factor or geopolitical concept is the concept which was presented in a uh, then popular way uh, by uh, Ferdowsi, uh, the poet, uh, Iranian poet, in its Shahnama. Uh, juxtaposing two regions, Iran and Turan. Well, I'm, I said juxtaposing. Uh, it means that, yes, there should be some kind of antagonism between these two parts. Uh, there should be uh, two enemies. On one side, uh, the enemy, which is uh, barbaric, nomadic, uh, underdeveloped, culturally underdeveloped uh, Turan. And on one other side, Iran, cradle of civilization, uh, the source of uh, culture, knowledge, philosophy, and so on, uh, fighting with each other. Symbolically, it's uh, actually marked in Ruhnama uh, on this small miniature, uh, speaking about the uh, fight of Rustam and Afrasia. But uh, who was Afrasia in uh, Shahnama? In the other, other picture, you can see two uh, men embracing each other. Afrasia and Turan Siavush. So uh, it means that uh, speaking about antagonism, I also um, included a question mark inside. Because uh, these two, uh, let's say, regions, these two geopolitical concepts uh, living side by side, uh, were not influenced only through antagonism. It was, uh, there was influence very significant and even mutual cultural uh, exchange and uh, culture, uh, culture influence from one side to another one. So uh, in this sense, uh, we might see Iran as Turan as one very important geopolitical concept and a way of thinking about we and they. But this we and they need not to be uh, absolutely uh, against each other. By the way, speaking about Iran and Turan, or uh, in other words, about Persian and Turkic civilization, this is something which creates the amalgam of Central Asian culture today. Because uh, if you look, even if you take uh, the history of Uzbek literature or textbooks of Uzbek literature, for example, they are uh, the Persian poets, uh, different Turkic poets are included. If you take uh, another literatures, also uh, you have uh, quite a lot, lot of uh, things from both, let's say, cultural layers, one Turkic and one uh, Iranian. So this is quite important issue uh, that geopolitical concepts need not to be uh, absolutely antagonistic. They could be complementary. And actually, actually even today, uh, speaking about this geopolitical struggle um, of great powers in Central Asia, well, if you look on for example, Russia and China, many authors uh, predict, OK, there will be a great geopolitical struggle between these two powers over this region. However, why couldn't be, well, maybe uh, on the other side of, uh, of meaning, other side uh, of some kind of economic uh, struggle, some kind of uh, uh, some cultural fight, but they might very easily complement uh, each other. And uh, it's not a question only of uh, today, contemporary geopolitics, but as you might see, it's a question of uh, very past, uh, on very, uh, very deep history. By the way, this, uh, this notion of Iran and Turan, uh, you have quite a lot of uh, reminiscences of this Middle, uh, middle Ages, Middle uh, Ages period uh, in European imagination. If you look uh, at this, we have two maps. Uh, from, let's say, the first uh, half of 19th century, when all these, Turan and Iran, is still included. 
even as the official name of the map. So uh, this geopolitical concept, you might see, even no longer existing or, or uh, much less existing on the real maps, because if you look, uh, we have Persian Empire and we have uh, different, in the a, in a first half of 19th century, we have different uh, regions, different um, states, Bukhara, uh, Khiva, and uh, Kokan at the time. Uh, but the notion of this, uh, this geopolitical uh, territory called Turan still persists. By the way, not only in European, uh, in European context. Uh, we have this context even in the 19th century uh, in Iranian literature. Uh, and of course, we have this mention of this concept uh, in Ottoman, uh, Ottoman literature, especially uh, in late uh, 19th and the beginning of 20th century, when this mystical Turan became uh, some kind of land of our Turkic bro Turkish brothers, the land of uh, our ancestors, uh, the land from, which, uh, from where we Turks came, and uh, with which uh, we should cooperate more. Now you have uh, the fundament uh, for pan-Turkist idea, ideas uh, based on this uh, geopolitical concept. So, uh, Iran and Turan. Well, speaking about uh, not geography, but speaking, for example, about religion as a geopolitical factor, uh, you might see this map. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't find uh, another map uh, in, uh, in English. However, uh, maybe it looks a little bit messy, but I will try to explain. Uh, here you have, uh, of course, different uh, steppe regions, uh, steppe uh, step regions in the uh, beginning of our uh, period uh, after that. And we have several states with geopolitical interest in Central Asia. Well, today Central Asia, this is just uh, not whole Central Asia, but what we call today Central Asia, I repeat, the borders of today Central Asia in a narrow sense are roughly here. And you can see an, yet another Central Asia, total different. Uh, but uh, you can see, yet again, uh, not struggling religious uh, identities, religions uh, in the region, but uh, they're rather the complementary usage. You have Sasanian Empire, uh, Persian Empire at that time, which influenced, uh, which had a lot of culture uh, influence in, the, in this region, bringing uh, their own uh, religion, Zoroastrianism. But you can see stretching from very far east of this map up to quite uh, far uh, west part of this map, a uh, lot of uh, Buddhist uh, monuments, a lot of Buddhist uh, monasteries, and uh, a lot of place of worship for Buddhists. And plus, in addition, one, two, three, and other, many other towers symbolizing Christian, Christian, uh, Nestorian in this case, uh, most Nestorian um, places uh, of worship. So you can see, yet again, this might be, let's say, religion. You can see religion as some kind of geopolitical factor, but uh, living in relatively uh, complementary and uh, uh, relatively peaceful coexistence. We spoke about migration. Yes, uh, I spoke several times about uh, uh, Turks migrating and, uh, and uh, making military campaigns and uh, creating migrant waves, waves in Central Asia. Well, you can see again uh, another Central Asia uh, where Turk, uh, Turkic tribes uh, expanded from their initial places of, uh, places of living up to Central Asian continent. So, uh, geopolitical influence through uh, migration and military campaigns. And of course, the, uh, I think the most famous, uh, let's say, geopolitical project in the Middle East, uh, in this sense, might be uh, Mongolian Empire. Well, here you can see, of course, the Mongolian Empire uh, divided into uh, several parts. 
uh, and uh, maybe not in a very appropriate way. But nevertheless, you can see that uh, in a, at the end of 13th century, or in the 13th century as such, starting from Genghis Khan, very devastating, uh, devastating uh, military campaigns. But uh, at the end of 13th century, we might see very vast geopolitical space stretching from uh, one of the may maybe one of the most uh, largest geopolitical spaces uh, in a, uh, human history, stretching from uh, Pacific Ocean and, uh, and eastern, uh, eastern uh, shores of today's China, Korea, and even uh, South Russia, up to almost up to Central, uh, Central Europe on one side, and from, let's say, uh, forests in what's today uh, southern Siberia up to uh, the uh, Middle Eastern deserts. Very vast and basically, to some extent, uh, one geopolitical area. Of course, with different governors, with different rulers, uh, but unified by, uh, let's say, one uh, Mongolian uh, dynasty. And of course, speaking about the Middle Ages, uh, we can't um, bypass uh, the significance of trade. But if you look at this map, actually, so if you, take, if you are a trader, you could take your uh, goods uh, in mid-China and going through up to uh, these western parts or uh, to the Middle East, what's today called Middle East, basically, uh, without uh, significant borders. I don't say without in a total security, of course, but without significant borders. If you look on today's map of Central Asia, and if you load the same, uh, same chain, for example, from in mid-China, trying to push uh, your, uh, your uh, car up to Central Europe, for example, up to Germany, uh, you might encounter with several border uh, delays on the border, which didn't exist. But uh, of course, uh, I understand, even if I understand the different uh, conditions of transport, uh, this was, let's say, very generally says, one uh, single, uh, single space, which uh, enabled flourishing of all uh, continental trade, which we called uh, uh, Silk Road. So we can see the place of Central Asia in this. And uh, Central Asia is basically in the middle of this, uh, of this whole network of, uh, of uh, route, uh, trade routes. So now uh, you might think, is Central Asia object or subject of geopolitics? A dead, peer, a dead period under these particular conditions. So uh, if you now just uh, short jump uh, to the contemporary history. Uh, you can see the comparison and uh, this kind of uh, geopolitical concept of uh, so-called one world, one belt initiative. You can compare it, of course, uh, again, I repeat, different conditions, technical conditions. However, Central Asia uh, is today rather object or subject of geopolitics in this particular game. Well, uh, geopolitics is not just about, this, uh, about uh, real borders, real migra migrations, uh, real trends, uh, struggle of religion or political struggle, military campaigns. As uh, geopolitics is very often performed by particular personalities, by particular group of people, uh, very often, we might see geopolitics as some kind of image, imagination of the region. And speaking about, for example, Central Asia, speaking about uh, great empires of the Middle Ages, uh, maybe not necessarily Mongol Empire, but other empires, as the Samanid empires uh, uh, in, uh, in a, uh, starting from 9th uh, to, uh, let's say, 11th century. Uh, speaking about uh, uh, Amir Timur Empire uh, in, uh, in Uzbekistan, in contemporary Uzbekistan, uh, we might see 
that uh, those interpretations also matter. Saying, okay, today we, are, we have our independent Uzbekistan. We have our independent Tajikistan. But in the past, it was this, this Tajikistan was like that. Was the great Samanian Empire. This Uzbekistan was here. This was the great empire. So this uh, projection and imagination of uh, former empires into today uh, also matters. And it can cause quite a lot of struggle, uh, troubles, struggles, and uh, at least uh, what we might uh, see as some kind of tug of war uh, between, for example, Uzbek and Tajik uh, historians, and even transforming these uh, struggles uh, and tug of wars into, uh, into politics. So uh, also speaking about uh, history, geopol historical geopolitics, we might also think about contemporary historiography, which also influence, uh, influences uh, the contemporary politicians, and they behave uh, accordingly. Well, speaking about uh, the imagination of others, we might think about also European perception of Central Asia. Uh, well, this is also quite a uh, vast uh, topic, but uh, from geopolitical point of view, we have quite a long history of, let's say, European romanticism uh, around Central Asia. It was some mythological region which was explored by just few uh, uh, European explorers starting from Marco, Marco Polo in Italy, uh, the, these uh, all diplomatic uh, missions to uh, Mongol empires, uh, up to, uh, up to uh, uh, Clavijo's mission to Tamerlan. But later on, when Silk Road uh, was in decline, uh, these great empires uh, dissolved, the notion of Central Asia remained in the sense of, yes, Iran, Turan, Shahname, uh, and, or, or uh, some mythological lands, as we have seen, uh, we might see this here, uh, Tartaria, Tartari, and, or sometimes Bukhari, Bukharia. Here you have, for example, very nice definition uh, from uh, old Encyclopedia Britannica. What do they think about uh, this region? This is actually what we might see as a perception, interpretation of European view on uh, Central Asia. So uh, speaking about, uh, speaking about uh, geopolitics, here we can see some kind of um, non-geopolitical alignment, just uh, Europe didn't care about Central Asia, at least up to 19th century, very much. Uh, and uh, it started, or it was revived from this romantic, rather romantic uh, approach up to uh, something which uh, we call, uh, we might call as a scientific uh, definition of Central Asia and political definition of Central Asia. In the 19th century, we have uh, actually the uh, even explosion of these two approaches uh, into Central Asian geopolitics. The revived interest from this romantic up to very pragmatic and practical uh, issues. Uh, in 19th century, in the uh, um, first half of 19th century, there were several attempts, several different attempts, how to define Central Asia. Well, you can see uh, one of the first ones, which, by the way, plays the core of Central Asia, the, the main part of Central Asia, not what we today call Central Asia, what we today called these former Soviet states, uh, the geometrical center, uh, according to Humboldt, uh, lies somewhere uh, in the north, uh, north Uyghur regions, north, uh, politically speaking, Xinjiang, today. And uh, dividing Central Asia, so today we, what we see, uh, as a, we consider it as Central Asia, uh, this was some kind of uh, lowlands, 
in today's Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, partly Turkmenistan. And partly uh, this mountainous cluster I spoke about, and plus uh, all these uh, regions which now are under the control of China. So uh, yet another perception of Central Asia which totally differs, even scientifically defined, but totally different from today's perception. Here we have uh, Russian geographers defining uh, the region. Yet again, starting from very uh, large definitions, including which includes into Central Asian regions, uh, very uh, vast regions, let's say a half of Eurasian continent, uh, uh, if, I, uh, if I generalize a little bit, up to relatively uh, pragmatic uh, definition and uh, definition which is much closer uh, to today's uh, understanding of Central Asia and what's based on very uh, rather pragmatical uh, view of Central Asia which turned out to be, uh, which, which uh, was reflected later on in the politics. Uh, well, we have yet still another definition even which uh, was worked out even after uh, the conquest of uh, Russia in the, uh, in the region. So even here, in a German, uh, German geographer say, uh, placed like, the main parts of Central Asia here and partly here, but uh, he said, okay, this is uh, the region uh, which is still already under the control of Russia. But uh, coming to the practical issue in uh, the 19th century, we can see the uh, first, let's say, European geopolitical concept, a European um, concept which influenced the history and geopolitics of Central Asia, which is called the Great Game. Uh, I provided uh, this picture, uh, the, not from Central Asia, but from Persia, which also was a part of uh, the so-called Great Game. But uh, looking at this map, we can see quite clear concepts, two concepts of Central Asia, which at some certain moment try to uh, struggle with each other uh, up to, let's say, the second half of 19th century, ending up with a, at, the, at the end of the 19th century with what we today have as the borders of, uh, political borders of Central Asia in a narrow sense uh, of, this, uh, of this term. So, uh, at least just in the end of 19th century, we might speak about what now we call Central Asia. And of course, even in this sense, uh, we might speak about, uh, about it uh, with a little bit cautious because it's not exact borders, especially here uh, in the East, uh, the borders still changed uh, even in 19th, 19th century. So uh, speaking about Central Asian uh, geopolitical concept, uh, we might uh, refer, con in a contemporary issue, we might refer just to this uh, border issues and border uh, delimitation uh, at the end of 19th century, firm or confirmed, which was confirmed uh, by Anglo-Russian uh, uh, treaty in 1907. So since that, uh, we might we might think about Central Asia as uh, the region which is somehow divided from other regions, from other regions which were either uh, geopolitical objects for Central Asia, uh, as the Persia, or uh, which were included uh, naturally in a cultural layer of Central Asian, uh, Central Asian uh, geopolitical space. What was one of the very important tools of uh, uh, control over this new geopolitical region? Uh, at the end of 9th century, speaking about uh, the conquest of last um, big region which was uh, about to be con uh, to, uh, conquest uh, by Russian Empire, we can see one very important geopolitical factor which cemented uh, Russian presence in Central Asia. It's Transcaspian Railway. So here we have another tool using transport, uh, new technical, uh, technical inventions uh, in a transport to cement their geopolitical position. So yet another aspect how to uh, make your geopolitical influence 
uh, in uh, real and uh, not just virtual. Speaking about uh, central Asian geopolitics in, 19, uh, in the 20th and the 21st century, of course, um, usually, usually writing about central Asian geopolitics, uh, most of uh, authors, they simply skip over the Soviet period, saying, well, it was basically under the Russian, uh, Russian slash Soviet influence, and consequently, it's not our business. It's not the thing we should uh, write about. But uh, even here, we might think about two aspects of Central Asia, uh, in a place of Central Asia, in uh, the wider geopolitical concepts. First of all, uh, as I spoke, we uh, might not think uh, about geopolitics as a global issue. We, might, we have to think about geopolitics in regional or, let's say, in a local way. If you look, uh, this is the map of Uzbekistan uh, in 1928. Quite different map uh, from today, isn't it? Including Actually, if you look uh, at the map, uh, this region, uh, the Uzbek SSR, includes quite significant regions, but uh, includes today Tajikistan, northern part of Tajikistan, and uh, other territories of Tajikistan. Not includes this westernmost part, uh, which is now called Karakalpakstan, which was adjoined uh, to, uh, to Uzbek SSR later on. Uh, but if you look at this great Uzbekistan, if you might call it, it was as a re uh, result as a result of so-called national delimitation in 1924. But this delimitation continued uh, up to at least uh, the basic phase uh, was ended up in 1936. But nevertheless, uh, we might look at uh, this map even from the geopolitical point of view. This was the let's say, victory of this great Uzbekistan geopolitical concept over another, especially Tajik uh, perception. Tajik delegation, uh, if you take uh, these national delimitation committees, uh, territorial committees within national delimitation, Tajik delegation was relatively weak. And uh, at the end, Bukhara delegation, which was uh, substantial, and uh, I would say even uh, according to some uh, scientists, the most important part of uh, these territorial committees, they opted for greater Uzbekistan in this, roughly in these borders, including all main cities, the most of main cities uh, in Central Asia. Tashkent, especially Tashkent, as a central, as a already established natural center of uh, Turkestan region, up to that time, and Central Asian region uh, in general, as the uh, place, as a center of uh, Russian Turkestan. But also uh, Samarkand, Bukhara, as uh, the most important cultural uh, centers, and also the centers of what today is called centers of Tajik, uh, Tajik culture. Which, of course, today has quite a lot of sig uh, quite significant uh, local consequences. Uh, in the 90s, there were quite a lot of, uh, let's say, history in the beginning of 2000s, there were quite a lot of historiographical wars between Uzbeks and, uh, Uzbek and Tajik historians. Okay, saying uh, Samarkand and Bukhara should be returned back to Tajikistan. We should come back to this concept of greater Tajikistan. Of course, uh, Uzbek historiography and Uzbek politicians, of course, they absolutely denied these issues. But here we have also this local geopolitics, which was uh, determined by uh, so-called national delimitation uh, in the Soviet times. I don't say purely by Soviets, because uh, the, this delimitation uh, was not uh, defined only, as sometimes is, uh, you can hear, it not, was not defined only in Moscow saying, OK, the Stalin like I, all, I sometimes I even can see Stalin uh, draw personally draw the borders. No, it was done mostly on the place, in Central Asia, within Central Asian context and Central Asian geopolitics. So it's regional level, which also matters and which also uh, touched uh, the 20th century. But uh, to 
move back uh, to this global arena and the place of Central Asia in a global, uh, global sense. Speaking about geopolitical concepts, speaking about uh, Mackinder, speaking about uh, Spikes and Rimland, uh, and other concepts um, in, uh, in the West after uh, the Second World War, well, uh, you might find this map where Central Asia has very significant role as a border region of what was called uh, in so-called capitalist world as um, the forepost of Soviet uh, socialist communist empire uh, in Asia, which should be, which has to be contained. In practical ways, you have this geopolitical concept, and in a very practical way, this is the establishment of uh, different alliances along these borders, Santo, uh, Seattle, and of course uh, NATO uh, in, uh, in Europe. But Central Asia, in this sense, was the borderline, border region with uh, border region of so-called communist empire, and uh, played a very significant role in this sense. And actually, it was uh, not touched up to 80s, of late uh, 70s uh, and 80s, when these borders were challenged, but not uh, towards Central Asia, but uh, from the Soviet Union. I mean, the occupation of Afghanistan by Soviet forces. We might discuss about uh, the reasons of that, but this was, let's say, crossing the red line uh, from geopolitical point of view. I don't speak, of, of course, about these parts, uh, which also uh, had a different role after, right after the Second World War or after uh, the victory of communists in China and the 70s or 80s, where China was in a different position. Yet again, volatile borders and volatile geopolitics. And after the dissolution of USSR, uh, there was enormous spread of different geopolitical concept, concepts of Central Asia. Uh, and yet again, these concepts were not uh, driven just by scientific interests. Very often they were driven by very pragmatic, realistic uh, geopolitical um, interests or national interests of some particular countries. Usually speaking about uh, geopolitics, we usually speak about uh, it's like American con different concepts. One uh, is based uh, on Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, Ch Grand Chessboard, uh, speaking about Central Asia as some kind of European Balkans. European Balkans uh, with a reference to those conflicts uh, outbreak in a uh, Balkan region after uh, 1991. Uh, we might speak in very practical use about Central and South Asia, or uh, as uh, Frederick Starr, another uh, author of geopolitical concept, uh, uh, call it Greater Central Asia, which includes especially Afghanistan, for very obvious reasons, uh, 2001 uh, and uh, Afghan campaign. But uh, as a practical step, you might see this. If you look at the, um, at the web page of State, uh, State Department, you can see that uh, Central Asia is uh, managed uh, within this uh, Central, Asian, Central and South Asian Bureau, merging for very obvious geopolitical reasons these two vast but quite uh, connected regions, especially in order to include Afghanistan to, uh, to the matters, to the board. Well, there are Chinese visions uh, of Central Asia. They're also pragmatic. And they are expressed in this way. Uh, they, uh, they don't speak about uh, military issues uh, concerning Central Asia. Uh, they even don't speak about uh, political issues. They don't speak about some kind of, yes, Central Asia, greater Central Asia, greater Middle East concepts, but behave in a very pragmatic way, saying Central Asia is one of the part of our 
great geopolitical concept, which was called uh, in 2013, but uh, which was called, it was not initiated. It was actually naming of already existing uh, uh, concept, which uh, labeled or which framed uh, vast activities of China, not only in Central Asia, but uh, in other regions as well, of course. So yet again, uh, we might see well, today we have a lot of conferences, articles about what is one world, one road. Basically, they repeat uh, the same aspects, same, same pictures, or going, uh, analyzing some small details of that. But, uh, well, this is an excellent label, absolute excellent envelope, into which we can put our different concrete projects uh, with uh, different states or groups of states. And this is the absolutely uh, case of these vast transport corridors uh, which stretch, stretch over Central Asian regions. So here we can see the usage of geopolitics for our economic reasons. And uh, under this geopolitical framework, we can put basically everything which what is in our interest in bilateral, in multilateral, uh, and other, uh, other relations with Central Asia, but not only with Central Asia, of course. You can see uh, Southeast Asian uh, concept, Middle East uh, uh, role in this, uh, in this region and so on. So in this case, speaking about uh, one belt, uh, one road, uh, place, uh, uh, Central Asia place in one belt, one road initiative, we might see it as some kind of, let's say, sometimes virtual, uh, virtual label, which uh, is, however, felt with very concrete uh, content. Well, we might speak also about uh, Russian concept, saying, OK, at least some influence, Russian influence, should be kept within a Central Asia. This is the, this is the region of our national interest, saying, uh, proclaiming uh, many documents of Russian foreign policy, which is quite obvious. This is a traditional uh, power and has a right to uh, be presented in this region. Maybe uh, Russia doesn't have so much economic power to uh, counterpart, to be counterpart of, of China, but it has still significant political, military, uh, social power, humanitarian power, uh, humanitarian influence in order to uh, keep this region uh, on some kind of uh, its board. So uh, you can see several different geopolitical concepts. And of course, I could provide you with the other Turkish view of Central Asia, Indian view, Iranian view of Central Asia. All these concepts, if you look at them, Russian, uh, Chinese, uh, US, however it be, it leads me to one uh, several conclusions. First of all, uh, we should think about geopolitics not, as, or not only as a scientific discipline, but mainly, which is um, very clear and uh, appeared more in the public as a political discipline. <coughs> and uh, geopolitical thinking <coughs> is the thinking which should influence uh, the politics, real politics, politicians, who are decision uh, in general, decision makers. And uh, you can see always these issues, this geopolitics, uh, from both perspectives. And uh, if you can do, I strongly recommend you to do uh, this exercise, looking at Central Asia, but to other regions, uh, you uh, might be, you might research, of course, from outside, using uh, quite an interesting method, using uh, Google Earth, and uh, pin uh, your center to Moscow, to Beijing, to London. And you can see how these uh, regions are seen from, from this very interesting exercise, which uh, you might uh, use as a kind of notion how uh, the elites and how the politicians, uh, decision makers in this or that particular uh, capital might see the region. And uh, the second point, uh, OK, even if we have Central Asia somehow defined today, it doesn't mean that Central Asia will not be, uh, will be the same in 
some distant future. Maybe in 100 years, there will be another uh, scientist, uh, scientific conference or another seminar for students. And uh, looking at the beginning of 21st century and saying, OK, well, at that time, these geopoliticians, well, look how stupid were they. How uh, did see wrongly Central Asia? How did, how did they see uh, Central Asia in a different way? Uh, in, in order to make it more moderate. So it means uh, geopolitics don't consider it as just contemporary discipline. It's very old uh, historical discipline, which uh, accompanies uh, basically whole history of uh, human beings. And uh, all empires, be it big empires, or even uh, regional empires or regional states, they uh, all, in some way or another, were involved in practice, at least in practical geopolitics, even if uh, it was not called geopolitics. Thank you very much. <laughs>